Praise God. Let's get it done in prayer tonight. Father, we praise you. We thank you, Lord, that you continue to establish your grace, your love in our midst. We thank you, O oh God, that Jesus Christ is in our midst. Most of all, Lord, we know we are in your perfect will. Doing that which you have beckoned us to do, Lord. Father, let your perfect will be established in each heart, in each life here tonight. We ask, O oh God, that your Holy Spirit will deal with our lives. Even tonight, as we sit in your presence, come, Holy Spirit, stir our hearts in you. Bring to mind all those things that the Lord Jesus Christ has been speaking into each heart and each life. Bring it so clear in front of each one of us. We will know, O oh God, with assurance, your voice, your word, your calling, your purpose, and your plan for each one of our lives. And we promise, O oh God, that in all that you do, we give you all the glory, all the worship, and all the honor. In Jesus' name, Amen. Tonight we are continuing on what we have started off this morning. Uh, we are teaching a series on uh, what God is saying about the moves of God in these last days. And this morning we touch on Moses' tabernacle and the seven kings of Israel and how they are linked together into the three major uh, moves of God. And uh, if you did not hear that word, remember to get that tip because this, this is a series. But even if you follow us tonight, uh, we will do that word in such a way that you could pick up from, where, uh, from wherever we start. We have shown how that uh, there are uh, different parts of Moses' tabernacle and how it represents different moves of God. We have shown how that in the outer court there is a brazen altar and a lever. And then uh, those two are together and they signify the feast of Passover and the feast of unleavened bread, which takes place on the 14th and on the 15th day and then seven days thereof. Then we have the table of showbread, which will be on the left side of the uh, tabernacle. Uh, but as you enter it, and you enter the first prayer, you will see it on the right side. If you look towards the ark, and it will be on that side. And the table of showbread, and on the opposite end will be the table of candlestick somewhere on this side. And uh, then before the second row will be the altar incense. And they have shown how the table of showbread and the feet and the candlestick represent the other two feasts of Israel, all these based on Leviticus 23 and Deuteronomy chapter 16. And uh, that will be the feast of first fruit and the feast of uh, week, which are connected to each other by a 49 day or uh, inclusive of the day of 50 day period. So from the time they celebrate the first feast of first fruit, up to the time they, they celebrate the Feast of Weeks, which goes on for approximately another seven days, there will be a period of uh, 50 days and they are tied together. That, con that, uh, second, that is what I call the second move of God. And then the third is the other two pieces of furniture, the altar of incense and the Ark of the Covenant, which is within the veil, within the second veil, and uh, they signify the other three feasts. The Feast of Trumpet, the Feast, uh, uh, which is the Feast of Trumpet, which takes place on the first day of the seventh month of the Jewish religious calendar, and uh, then the Day of Atonement, which takes place on the tenth day of the seventh month, and then the Feast of Tabernacles, which takes place on the fifteenth day, which takes place on the fifteenth day of uh, 
the seventh month. All the last three feasts take place on the seventh month. The first two feasts take place in the first month. And uh, the others are in between. So we realize that the, three, the seven feasts are divided into three separate sections. And we have shown our place in history how that in the major moves of God there are many ways. But there are three major uh, peaks or movements in which God does. Uh, the first is the Reformation. The second is what we signify at the turn of this century, the Pentecostal revival, which has its subways that flow along. Uh, healing revival, which restores the gifts of the Spirit. All this has to do with our pouring of the Spirit. Uh, the Word movement, again, uh, bring us back to the Word. And then we have the uh, uh, Gospel Businessman Revival, which is the same offering of the Spirit, but on a different group of people. But it's the same basic move. And we have shown how that we are somewhere between, somewhere between the Feast of Pentecost and the Feast of Comfort, if we have not started touching on the Feast of Comfort. And we have shown how that where we are in history in the move of God is the Feast of Trumpet, the Day of Atonement, and the Feast of Tabernacles. When God moves, He always works days on the timings in the spirit realm. There are seasons and times of God. He does not work based on the times in the natural realm. And in the seasons, in the spiritual realm that God moved in, we are coming to a time of the Feast of Trumpet, followed by the Day of Atonement and the Feast of Tabernacles. And it is at this stage that we begin to see what we call the tail end of what God is doing of the prophetic move. You could classify almost a move of God into this manner where you would have the brazen altar that signify the feast of Passover and the feast of unleavened bread, which is in the outer court, that first move of God in the Reformation uh, era, which resulted in evangelism and in the word of God going forth, etc., as a move that sort of launched forth uh, the evangelist. The evangelist. And, uh, and he stands in the outer court and he calls the people unto God. And uh, there's an evangelistic flow that is there. Now, in every other move, what God begins will contain what has begun before. Every move of God was never, was never, I repeat, was never supposed to die off. Every move of God was supposed to to lead to the next one, and the next one was supposed to include what went on previously. We were not to forget the old, but to hold fast to the old and enter the new, which is the will of God. So we have, in the second major move of God, what we call that Pentecostal period, in which we are coming to the tail end. And in that Pentecostal period, we have various sub-ways and sub-moves, but basically you see in a Pentecostal move, the ministry of the pastor and the ministry of the teacher standing tall. It is in a Pentecostal move that you begin to see the gifts of the Holy Spirit being restored, being taught, like for example, in the early days of the Pentecostal revival, it was people like uh, Howard Carter who began to teach on the gifts of the Spirit, and uh, then others begin to catch on. And it's during the era that we find uh, the rise of uh, many of these great churches today all over the world and the rise of uh, many other uh, teaching ministries. And at the same time, we see that the, what went on previously, like the evangelist, still continues in the second area. Now, as we come to the next area, in the Feast of Trumpets, the Day of Atonement, and the Feast of Tabernacles, we will notice that it leans towards the prophetic and the apostolic. There have been many prophecies in that area, 
And we are talking about the third wave, the third pool that God is bringing forth. A third major wave that God is bringing forth. The others are all ripples. There are only three major waves from heaven. But there are a lot of ripples caused by each wave. So the third wave is about to begin. With God asks and God speaks. One of the most important things as we see in this area of the uh, altar of incense, and as we enter into the second veil, is the timing of God in His working. A lot of the major moves of God are always tied around the feet. I repeat, a lot of the major moves of God are tied around the feet. We have, like uh, tonight I'll spare some of you who have been standing throughout my morning session. Some of you were not around. Uh, we have some of them standing all the time and we will spare some of you tonight. <laughs> Tomorrow we go after you again. <laughs> Uh, and in case you're thinking about sitting in a back seat tomorrow, we go for the back benches too. <laughs> but uh, what we have, you can put that back after the meeting, <laughs> uh, during the ministry. The brazen altar, and uh, then we have the lever. You have the plants that are standing for you, those of you there. Oh, praise God. <laughs> And uh, one right there, thank you. And one right there on that step, thank you. <laughs> that will do. Very nice. Praise the Lord. And uh, don't worry, we get a move afterwards. The brazen altar that represents the Jesus Christ, the Lamb. The lever, Jesus Christ, the Word. I repeat it until by the end of the session, you will memorize it by heart. As you enter the second wheel, the first wheel, you have the table of showbread, Jesus Christ, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and then the candlestick, Jesus Christ, the giver and baptizer of the Holy Spirit, and then you have the, the altar of incense, the altar of incense, praise the Lord, right before the second wheel, right? Second wheel. And uh, the altar of incense and represent Jesus the High Priest. Each one representing a principle which will balance any church and make it an apostolic church. If you heard what we said this morning, that you don't have to be called to be an apostle to have an apostolic church. That when all these are functioning equal and strong in any church, it becomes an apostolic church in the an end time church. We have here the power of the blood, Jesus the Lamb, the lever, Jesus the Word, the power of the Word, table of showbread, the power of the name of Jesus, and uh, we have there the candlestick, Jesus, the power of the Holy Spirit, and uh, the altar of incense, the power of praise and worship, and then of course the Ark of the Covenant, the power of the presence of God, which will be the final, the finale of God's revelation of all his moves. And we have also shown that, that these two are one, are one set of keys. And the, those two are one set of pieces, the table of showbread and the candlestick. And then these other two pieces, the rest of the three pieces of Israel. And what is happening is that every time God does a move, He signs it according to a spiritual timing, not a secular timing. The Jews have two calendars. They have a secular calendar and a religious spiritual calendar. The Passover was actually the, the secular third month. But God said you shall call it the first month. It is just like God coming and saying March shall be the, the beginning of your year. It's just January. And uh, you notice that when Israel came out of the land of Egypt, God said, mark it down, Passover. And every time when God does a tremendous move, Depends on what he's doing. When he's, it, when he calls his people out of the world, the ministry of the evangelist, there are also four horns on this resin altar. 
going to the four corners of the earth. When he calls the people out of the world, it is always tied to the Passover. It's always tied to the Passover. When there is a revival and people are in the world, of believers who are worldly and in sin, and he calls them out of the world, like in Hezekiah's time, Every time you can trace, I'm a student of the Bible and study backwards, forwards, frontwards, sideways, inside, outside. <laughs> Every move of God in the Bible is tied to a feast. The feasts are called the feast of the Lord. And every year, God made the Israelites during those days when the feast were a prime king, repeat the whole thing in a prophetic way. And when Jesus manifests his choose a particular feast all the time, he manifests, the anointing comes on him at a, at a particular feast. So when you see John chapter 7, it was a feast of tabernacles. And Jesus went secretly and said openly, uh, when it was the last day of the feast of tabernacle, which takes place seven days, Jesus stood up and said, Come unto me, all ye who are thirsty. See, Jesus' manifestation is trying to the feast. Although the Jews do have a certain record of their religious feast, but through the generations there are some uh, areas that may have changed, and so uh, don't try to predict by trying to look at the Jewish calendar, religious calendar, and say, I think since it's not the Feast of Tabernacles time, Jesus will not be coming soon. <laughs> that will be the opposite of what we're trying to say. But every time God does something, it's tied to a feast. What's happening is that during a manifestation or a prophetic manifestation of a third way, there are always types and shadows in the Bible. Just like Enoch is a type of the raptured church before the, before the flood. There is always a type, and Noah represents the other believer that saved from the flood. So there is a type all the time in the Bible, types and shadows. Every time God manifests and brings his people into his presence and when he speaks about the end times it is close to the altar of incense it has something to do with the celebration that revolves around the altar of incense every time when there is a working that has to do with a, a gathering of the church things that go on within the church See, there are three major things that we need to note, note of. First is refreshing. Second, restoration. Third, outpouring. Whenever there is restoration, it falls within this area here. The first feast of first fruit and the feast of week, the day of Pentecost. You see, in Acts 2, even when they were praying, after Jesus told them to pray for the Holy Spirit, the Bible says in verse 1 or Acts 2, When the day of Pentecost had fully come, now we could rationalize it that the reason why God did it during that time was because all the people were gathered during that time. But if you were to trace backwards and forward to what God is doing, it is tied to the happening in the sea, in heaven. What Moses received was only the shadow of the true out of the covenant out there. And what we want to show you that the church is in in these days is we have seen the second wave, which includes both of the old, and the third that is coming for which begins from the feast, between the feast of which, which is the lampstand and the altar incense. Between the lampstand and the altar incense. And strangely enough, when the book of Revelation begins, it begins with the lampstand. The book of Revelation speaks primarily 
a major portion of it takes about the seven years of tribulation, but there's a small section that has to do with the church. And I want you to know it always is tied to the heavenly sea. And if you examine it carefully, it doesn't start with the vision altar there. It starts with the lampstand. Revelation chapter 1, please. The book of Revelation chapter 1. The first revelation that John has for the resurrected, perfected Christ is in chapter 1. Verse 4, John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him, who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before the throne. Then, in verse 20, the mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. Notice, he starts with the lampstand. He starts with the lampstand, the candlestick. This is the heavenly lampstand and candlestick. Then he moves on in chapter 2. Again, he repeats in chapter 2, verse 1, the lampstand. By chapter 5 and chapter 8 of Revelation, he moves to the altar of incense. Look at Revelation. Chapter 5, verse 8. Now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lord, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. We are in Revelation chapter 5, verse 8. Uh, some of you were in the morning, and I hope you did not bring the Old Testament tonight and forgot your new. <laughs> and in the morning, you brought your new and you forgot your old. <laughs> uh, bring both. <laughs> we go all over the Bible. In Revelation 5, verse 8, notice it begins to talk about incense. Now look at Revelation 8. Revelation 8, verse 3. Look at the movement. They have already, they, they didn't even start with the brazen altar and the lever. They start with the lampstand. Now, by chapter 8, the position spiritually is at the altar of incense. In chapter 8, verse 3, Then another angel, having a golden censer, came and stood at the altar. And he was given much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. This is not the, the Moses altar incense. This was the same altar that Moses saw in the forty days and forty nights in heaven. Oh, he saw the pattern in heaven and he came down from that mount. And told the Israelites, this is what God said to me. Although the tabernacle of Moses, the temple of Solomon was glorious, it was nothing compared to Revelation 8, the real altar of incense in heaven, before the throne. And he has shown from Hebrews 9 this morning that in heaven, the altar of incense was in the most holy place. While in Moses' pattern, it was outside of the outside the most holy place. It's in the holy place, but outside the most holy place. It was in front of the veil. In heaven, in Hebrews 9, the picture is actually inside the veil with the ark. So in heaven, there are three sections. The outer court, which has two main altars, then there is the middle place called the holy place which has two pieces of furniture and then the most holy place has two. But in Moses' pattern, the outer court has two, the middle section called the holy place has three and the most holy place has one, the ark. All these are in the scripture, in case some of you are not familiar, it's in Hebrews 9 and we have read it this morning for the sake of some of you who are not around. Let's read Hebrews 9. When we start to some of these areas and people think that it's new, but they didn't read in the Bible, 
It's all. It's all as this word. Hebrews 9, verse 3, it says, Behind the second wheel. Without a shadow doubt, behind the second wheel. Then he repeats, In the most holy place, and he described what he had, which had the golden altar. It's behind the wheel. This is the true pattern that Moses saw. Why then did God put it outside? Because every day they got to put incense in the morning and in the evening. And they cannot enter the most holy place but once a year on the tenth day of the seventh month, the day of atonement. So it was more practical to put it outside because no one can put incense inside. For the sake of humanity, God put it outside. But the true pattern was inside. What we see in the book of Revelation, that by Revelation 8, the involvement in the heavenly place was around the altar of incense in heaven. By Revelation 21, you see, the Bible says, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. It's the finale of Revelation is the feast of tabernacle. Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. You could see the pattern in the flow of the book of Revelation. Also in sense to the feast of tabernacle, the true one where God tabernacle again among men. So we see here a pattern of revival that God is doing. And between the lampstand and the other incense is where we stand. And we need to take note on the altar of incense, which is our focus tonight. We are doing a series of six sessions. We are now reaching the altar of incense. Why it involves? What's that mean that flows for? I want you to notice that a lot of the prophetic need is tied to the altar of incense. A lot of the evangelistic move is tied to the Passover and the Lever. A lot of that Pentecostal move is tied to the candlestick, the gift, the ministry, candlestick, and the table of showbread. The gift and the ministry. Turn with me to the book of First Samuel, and we look at First Samuel in chapter three. Everybody almost remembers the story of First Samuel three, when God called Samuel three times. Samuel, Samuel, and Samuel came to Eli and said, "Did you call me?" Eli said, "No, I didn't go back to sleep." The night he came again. Samuel, Samuel. Some of you say, how do you know God's voice is like that? <laughs> I heard his voice and uh, God doesn't have a creepy voice. And, uh, but uh, I know that God's voice can sound like anything to each one of us. Perhaps to some of you, his voice may sound... <laughs> See, his voice sounds like rolling water. And it sounds like anything, and it's a sweeter ear that picks it up. Say, Samuel, Samuel, Samuel got up again, came to Eli and said, Oh, did you call me? Eli said, No, no, I, I didn't call you, go back to sleep. Why Eli loves to sleep? Go to sleep. Third time, Samuel, Samuel. He came again. Poor Eli now getting restless. Say, uh, say, you call me? No, I didn't call you, said Eli. Go back to sleep. But I think God is talking to you. The next time you hear that voice say, Here am I, Lord, thy servant here. And as he ran, Eli said, That took, uh, took care of him. And on the street. <laughs> That night, God called Samuel again. And that was the beginning of Samuel's prophetic ministry. That's the beginning of the ministry that began in his life and grew into the office of a prophet. But I want to know how and when it started. 
Prophetic moves are always tied to the altar of incense. Look at chapter 3, verse 3. And before the Lamb of God went out in the tabernacle of the Lord, where the ark was, while Samuel was lying down to sleep, it gives you the time. The Lamb of God was about to go out. Which Lamb? The candlestick. The candlestick was about to go out. But because some of us do not know what goes on in the Jewish cities, so we give you a little bit of background about what happens between the lampstand and the, and the incense. See, there's a connection between these two in what God is doing. Between the third, uh, second wave and the third wave. And we need information from Exodus chapter 30. Let's look at the book of Exodus. Notice in Exodus chapter 30, verse 1, right to verse 10, he speaks all the instructions about the altar of incense. And he says, You shall make an altar to burn incense on, you shall make it of a cassia wood, a cubit shall be plain and a cubit sweet, it shall be square and two cubits shall be tied. That's the highest piece of furniture uh, of all the six pieces in Moses' tabernacle. It's the highest, two cubits. You shall overlay its top, its side, all around its horns, its pure gold. You shall make for it a moving of gold all around. And then it goes on to verse 6. And you shall put it before the veil that is before the ark of the testimony, before the mercy seat that is over the testimony where I will meet with you. That is the ark of the covenant. Aaron shall burn on its sweet incense. Every morning, now notice, every morning, Aaron shall burn incense on the altar of incense. Every morning, fresh incense. And then, when he stands the lamb. You see, the lamb, the lamb stand is spread from underneath by pure olive oil. And it burns constantly. But that lamp stand needs to be trimmed from time to time. Whenever the lamp stand is trimmed, in case you did not know it, the light goes off. The light goes off while they're trimming. You don't expect them to you know, put their hand on the fire and then it's trimming. How do you know the light goes off? Because in eight, in verse 8, you have to light it again. He likes it again. Although the Bible uses the word perpetual fire and altar before the Lord, perpetual is perpetual daily. Every day they put it and it's supposed to burn until it's almost finished and it'll be evening time and they do it again. So the lamp time will be the same. It's burning. And God says, whenever you clean the lamp, where the light has to go out in the most in the holy place, you must put incense. Because something sacred is happening between the piece of wick and the piece of trumpet. When one thing ends, remember, as long as we are on this earth, every ending leads only to a new beginning. There is no real ending. There is no real completion until we meet face to face with Jesus. The end of every move only signifies the beginning of a new. And when the lamb stands are trim, you must, he told Aaron, put incense so that the incense fill the place and becomes a covering. Notice something. As the day of the Lamb's stand ends, the altar of incense will be increased. Then we read on. It says here that uh, verse 8, When Aaron writes the Lamb at twilight, you see there are two major offerings that must go on every day. They are called the morning offering and the evening offering. 
So every morning, they will burn some offering here, outside, and uh, that will involve the lever, and then it will involve the candlestick, it will involve the showbread, it will involve the incense. Every evening will be another special time, and uh, it says here, at twilight, you shall light the lamp, and you shall burn incense on it, a perpetual incense before the Lord. So that tells you something. The lighting of this lamp and the burning of the incense are also connected. There is also a connection between the two. Now, as we come back to the call of Samuel, when God calls Samuel, it says in First Samuel chapter 3 that the lamb, the lamb, the lamb of God was going out. That tells you that uh, two things. It's either the lamb needs trimming, or it comes to the time where the altar incense needs to be increased. And the incense is burning. So here we see in First Samuel chapter 3, in verse Three again. In that light of that knowledge, we read, Before the Lamb of God went out. Apparently, it was important for the altar incense to begin. Right about that time, Samuel received the prophetic call. The prophetic call. Now turn with me to the book of Luke chapter 1. The Holy Spirit doesn't record all these things by accident. We have heard prophecies about the move of God, the prophetic move of God, and we are tying all these together with scriptures. In Luke chapter 1, <laughs> verse 8 and 9, I want you to notice the timing again. See, God is going to start off a prophetic move. And remember this morning we say that the males present themselves three times a year, according to Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 16. The first time is at the tail end of the first move. The feast of Passover and the feast of unleavened bread. The second time is in the feast of weeks, the second move. The third time is in the feast of tabernacles. And the presentation of the males in the Old Testament represents the perfection of Christ, the full stature of Christ in our lives. And according to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 and 12, the perfection will take place to all the fivefold ministries. And God gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, and some teachers. You will notice that we each one of these great tools of God, or great ways of God, there are only three, there will always be a manifestation of all the fivefold, although they may not be called by that name. In that first way, they were apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers who worked at their level of their anointing God released in the Reformation period. Then in that second major way of the uh, Pentecostal move, the feast of first fruits and the feast of uh, wheat, there is also a revival of the fivefold. Now we have seen the close of that and coming near the third wave, which again will have a third presentation of the males, which is like the perfection of the body of Christ with the fivefold involved. So you don't have to worry when you talk about the prophetic age and you are called to be uh, an evangelist. Say, hey, have I been left behind somewhere there at the brazen altar? No, you have not. In every way, there is always a fivefold working together. In perfect king, the perfect man of Christ in us. Now, Luke chapter 1, it says, here in verse 8 and 9, So it was, this is Zacharias the priest, while he was serving as priest before God in the order of his division, according to the custom of the priesthood, his lot fell to burn incense, 
when he went into the temple of the Lord. Do you see that? It's time to burn the incense again. And the time to burn incense is when the lamps are lighted, when the lamps need to be trimmed, and when the lamps go out. It's time to burn the incense. And as Zacharias took the censer in that day, everybody was quiet. And they were waiting for that old man. He was very old by that time. And as he entered, they, all the people had to be in the outer court. They saw him enter the first veil. And as he entered in to put incense, verse 9, it says it was his lot to burn incense. He went into the temple of the Lord. The whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the hour is called in verse 9, it's called, uh, in verse 10, it's called the hour of incense. Everybody say the hour of incense. Want you to know that we are coming close to the hour of incense. The hour of incense. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him standing at the right side of the altar of incense. Standing on the right side, looking at him. Everybody outside was praying, didn't know what was going on. Zechariah was troubled, disturbed. He was in shock. For a small period of time, but reasonably long, because all the people outside, in verse 21, were wondering why Zechariah took so long. They know he's a bit old, but they didn't expect this. And they were waiting very long. Usually when such things happen, people have suggested some smart airline may have said, I think it's, you know, it's a bit old. He may have gone out inside. Another negative guy may say, well, you know, he has been having heart complaints recently. And of all things, why must he have a heart failure inside? Everybody is waiting anxiously and he didn't come out. I don't know how long it took that conversation between him and the angel. The hour of incense. But when Zechariah came out, everybody took one look. Say something is different. Say, hello Zechariah, what's happening? And say, say something Zechariah, what has happened? Big angel. Very difficult. That day he has to go back. And he met his wife and said, Hi dear, dinner is ready. What's wrong with you? And he has to communicate. And of course, he probably write it down. That the angel said, Elizabeth was going to have a baby. I do not know. My body record, it may not happen. Whether Elizabeth also hangs on. <laughs> then we have another story. <laughs> But the most important thing we see here is the altar of incense, the hour of incense God called John the Baptist. God ordained a prophetic move in the life of John the Baptist. I want you to see how remarkably the Holy Spirit ties up evangelism with Passover. Restoration with Pentecost and prophetic, apostolic, apostolic with tabernacles, apostolic with the incense. Book of Daniel, chapter 9. Although in Daniel's time they did not have any temple, yet the timing of heaven was still tied to the tabernacle of God in heaven. 
He is God's tabernacle above. In chapter 9, in chapter 9, it says there in verse 20 and 21, Now while I was speaking, praying, and confessing my sin, and the sin of my people Israel, and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God, for the holy mountain of my God, Yes, while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, which I had seen in a vision, at the beginning being called to fly swiftly, reached me about the time of the evening offering. And the evening offering is where we always have the altar of incense having a fresh load of incense. Now the interesting thing is that every time they have the altar incense, it includes the others. It will have the uh, pass oh, the the uh, offering sin offering outside, uh, which includes the lever, and then goes to all this, and then comes right up to here. Always, the third move will include the other move. But the other moves may not include the third move. That's the difference. The other moves may not include the third move, but the third move will include the other move. And you notice that when the angel came, Gabriel, the timing was according to the altar of incense. Now please don't jump to conclusions and say therefore angels appear only at twilight. So every, every twilight and every uh, sunset we'll see a lot of Penang night sitting there staring at the sea waiting for an angel. No, that will be wrong. It is a spiritual meaning that's important tying us back to the revelation of how the moves of God have been revealed even from days of old in Moses' time. And how we are all tied to the altar of incense in the great move of God. We will look at the Feast of Tabernacles tomorrow morning. <laughs> but we will look at the altar of incense today. And see the significance of the move because the altar of incense has shown to you is tied up to the prophetic way which we are talking about in the decade of the 80s, which is reaching a climax in this decade of the 90s and will lead into the apostolic flow. It is talking about revival in our day. And we need to realize that there are things that are important that are linked to the also incense that is involved. A lot of the problems that are described in the Bible, the major areas involve the altar of incense. And God records them for a specific purpose. And we will look at those three areas. Number one, that we have to have the right incense. The wrong incense with the right person makes it wrong. One of the first things that happened when the tabernacle was set up was in Leviticus chapter 10. In Leviticus chapter 10, after the tabernacle was set up, two of the sons of Aaron named Nadab and Abihu. Nadab and Abihu came to the Lord at the altar of incense in verse 1 took his censer, put fire in it, and put incense and offered profane fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. I want you to know how important it is when you serve the altar incense. You cannot do it any time you like. God has his timing. There are two sub-points that we see in this first point in regard to the incense. Number one, the incense must be right. Number two, the timing must be right. If 
you get the incense and place it at the wrong timing, perhaps it's in the afternoon. And God says, evening, your day, straight away. Which was what made it, and Abuhu realized, this is not just a ceremonial thing, God is involved. And they paid the price with their lives. In the book of Leviticus, chapter 16, God specifically told Aaron, in verse 2, God told Moses to tell Aaron your, his brother and says in verse 2, Leviticus 16, verse 2, Tell Aaron, your brother, not to come at simply any time into the holy place, inside the way before the mercy seat, which is on the up lest he die, for I will appear in a cloud above the mercy seat. He says, if he approach any time he may die. That's in the second will. But that command also applies outside here. In the altar incense. In Exodus chapter 30. Exodus chapter 30. We see in verse 9 God says. You shall not offer strange incense on it. Or a burnt offering or a meal offering. Nor shall you pour a drink offering on it. In other words. Some of the things that are right to do outside are wrong to do here. Notice he said, you cannot take that burnt offering that was supposed to be out here in the outer court at the brazen altar. The burnt offering. Which is right in its context. Which is rightfully here and bring it here and burn it on the altar inside just because it's also an altar. The burnt offering is not allowed in the altar incense. Neither is the drink offering. Neither is the meal offering. I know other strange offering. God is particular about that also incense. Only pure incense. Ordained my God is allowed. That incense speaks about the method, the message, the principles that we have. I want you to know that we have come to a time when God is concerned not just any old method will do where the end justify the means. Some of the things we get away the past 20 years you cannot get away in 1990. Some of the things that God will permit For a period of time, in his imperfect church, he will not permit over here as you close, draw close to the altar incense. And some of the things we get away with because you did the right thing in the wrong time and by grace you made it, you were not made it here. Because the right thing in the wrong time still is wrong. That may be tolerated. We have come to a time when God will expose it. We come to a time when God will not put up with the thing that the previous generation has put up with. He will not. It's a sacred call of God. I want you to know, as the third way comes, many may that and every who may die. Who gives the right incense in the wrong time, possibly because they were drunken. Which is why after Leviticus 10, God says, they shall not have any wine. He forbade it. It was not in their right mind. Nadab and Abihu represented anointed, called, chosen people. 
but they miss God on the inside. A lot of things revolve around the intent in this prophetic world. God is calling the people to draw nine. To give up some things that they have put away for so long. So that they will come into the perfection of the manhood of Christ Jesus. There is a new generation of ministers that are coming forth. And they will not put up with those things that the old generation put up with. It's a time. And God is dealing with a type of incense and the timing of our incense. We have to be, make it right. The second major problem that is described in the Bible about the altar incense and the censer is Second Chronicles chapter 26. The second major error. Second Chronicles 26. And it tells us here about a great king. Verse 16. His name was Uzziah. And he lived during the time of Uzziah the prophet. Verse 16. When King Uzziah was strong, his heart was lifted up to his destruction, for he transgressed against the Lord his God by entering the temple of the Lord to burn incense on the altar of incense. So Azariah the priest went in after him, and with him were eighty priests of the Lord who were valiant men. They withstood King Uzziah and said to him, it is not for you, Uzziah, to burn incense to the Lord, but for the priests, the sons of Aaron, who are consecrated to burn incense. Get out of the sanctuary, for you have trespassed. You shall have no honor from the Lord. Then Uzziah became furious, and he had a censer in his hand to burn incense. He was angry with the priest. Leprosy broke out on his forehead, and the priest put him all outside in verse 20 and saw how the Lord struck him. Second major area, a transgression of the call of God. Uzziah was not called to handle the incense. It was not the work of a king, it was the work of a priest. He went into the first veil took the censer, stood right at the altar of incense, and God struck him. Second major error. As we draw near, my friends, to the third way, William Abraham talked about it before he died. The third way, the third pool. He didn't know why he was called a third. This morning we have shown why it was called the third. Because there are three major sections, three major ways of what God is doing in the church. As we draw near, God is going to deal with our lives on our call. When I say call, we need to understand that God calls not only fivefold ministries, but He also calls people like Bezalel and Aholiah. Do you notice that there is also an anointing and a call out there in the business world? I just give you one scripture. Just for those of you who stand in that office. In the book of Exodus, God specially mentioned chapter 31, verse 2 of Exodus. He says, I have called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur of the tribe of Judah. Notice, these are not fivefold ministers, these are skillful men outside who had a part in the tabernacle of Moses. When I mention call, don't visualize just fivefold calling. Call. Every one of us have a plan and purpose. 
as we draw near to the third wave, it will be even more important not to transgress our offices that God has called us to. Whether it be in the public or in the private, public or private, recognized, unrecognized, is not important. It is becoming more critical and more important that we be in the perfect will of God. Doing what God has asked us to do. Sometimes we may do it without a soul recognizing it. But you are faithful to what God asks you to. That's the second major thing that we need to understand about the altar incense. Faithfulness to the call. Avoid transgression or offices. You see, the past 20, 40, 50 years, God will put up with a pastor trying to evangelize. God will put up with an evangelist trying to pastor. God will put up with an evangelist trying to be a prophet. God will put up with a prophet trying to be an evangelist to a certain extent. But when we come close to the third way, He will not put up with that. He will not put up with that. God will deal and shape to prepare for everyone to find their place in His kingdom and be faithful to the center that God gave into your hands. In the third area, it's a positive point. We see how the whole ceremony of the center and what it involves. That's where we look at chapter 16 of Leviticus. The book of Leviticus chapter 16. And it describes what will happen on the tenth day or the seventh month, the day of atonement. And here is where the fullness of the censor takes place. You see, in the first day of the seventh month, they will have a feast of trumpets where the trumpet blows almost throughout the day. The trumpet will be blowing. The call to prayer and praise and worship. Blowing all the time. Continuously more than at other times. And then, there will be a time. There are different stages in the third way. The first stage is the feast of trumpet. The second stage is the day of atonement. The link between the Day of Atonement and the Ark of the Covenant is Leviticus 16, the censer. So we need to understand that work of the censer, that we could move into the third wave and link it into the final wave that God wants, the final fullness that God wants us to express of the third wave that God wants to move in these days. In chapter 16, God says, <coughs> After Aaron has put all his uh, different sacrifices uh, in order, notice how specific he is in verse 4, 5 and 6 about the clothing and the washing in water. That day he must wash himself in water and he must put a sin offering. In other words, the third wave will involve the other two waves. The evangelists will come forth. Pastors and teachers will come forth. All the other pieces of furniture and what they represent will be important because he has to come through the whole thing. But the difference is this. He's going to come through them very quickly because the target is the altar incense. So where before, they will celebrate the Passover and stand there. Reformation period came to a peak and stood there like he waited for another move. And uh, that was the Pentecostal move at the turn of this century. But as the third way begins, it's like all the other ways suddenly come at one time and then bring us usher in. See, Aaron, the high priest, has to quickly wash himself, cleanse himself, offer the sin offering and deal with the level which was the feet of these uh, animals that are offered. And then from there, very quickly, on that same day, he must finish all the work on the same day. 
come into the most uh, the holy place and uh, uh, put a lamp stand, light it again, put fresh uh, incense and everything, and the target is to enter into the second venue. So all the other waves will take place very fast. In the third wave, the second wave involves the first. In the Pentecostal revival, we see world evangelism always re-emphasized. It always is emphasized again and again. The second wave involves the first, all the time. It's like almost an automatic thing. When people are filled with the Spirit, evangelism comes in. Where before, to even evangelize was a controversy. They didn't believe in justification by faith. Until Martin Luther came to the scene. So we see in the third way, all the other two will just come to pass very fast. And it's like God wants us to move into the altar incense and enter in. That's where we see in this point of point, uh, point 3a, in this third area as you enter, in a positive area after point 1 and point 2 talking about two errors. And uh, here's the gist, the keys, the principles of the altar incense. Which is number one, it will involve, it will involve skill, ability and understanding of uh, the other two ways. He must know how to go through the washing, the Passover, and all the other offerings here. The lamb stand. See, he has to have the right clothing. All these involve the other two ways. In the Feast of uh, Weeks of Pentecost, restoration takes place. Restoration in the church represents the high priest being clothed correctly. Being restored. Now, that's the first point. The second here, as we look at Leviticus chapter 16, he says in verse 12, He shall take a censer full of burning coals of fire from the altar before the Lord with his hands full of sweet incense beaten fine and bring it inside the veil. He shall put the incense on the fire before the Lord that the cloud of incense may cover the mercy seat that is on the testimony. I want you to notice verse 13, the last phrase. Let he die. We have always said that it's the blood, the blood that he brings that prevent him from dying. The blood is foundational. He must be without sin, no doubt. The sin must be on the land. The sin offering. But my friends, this is the exact thing that happened. Visualize the second veil. Praise the Lord. Perhaps I could help you visualize. <laughs> uh, could we bring these two here right to the center? Thank you. Yeah. Yes, these two will do. Praise God. The second veil. And... Uh, Yeah, put them together. That's right. Oh, thank you. Visualize the second veil. This is exactly what must happen. And uh, the altar incense is here before the second veil. The high priest on the tenth day of the seventh month, as he comes, not only take the blood, from that sacrificial lamb. Before he goes in, he must take a censer. A censer is like a long instrument that contains a, a place where you could put a coal of fire and incense. And then he must take incense, place it on that censer, and as he holds it, just before he enters the second veil, he must take a coal of fire, I guess with a tongue, put it on the censer where the incense is. The moment the coal of fire touch the incense, it burns and a cloud is produced. And as the cloud is produced, it covers the whole place, it covers the high priest too. The high priest has to quickly, under the covering of the cloud, enter the 
will shoot, put the blood inside, quickly come out, shoot. Before it says Leviticus 16, lest he die. Notice he must enter under the cloud covering. He cannot enter without the cloud of incense. It is a must if he wants to come out alive. Which is why the Hebrew tradition tells us once a year when the high priest goes in, the high priest has his garment and under his garment is a pomegranate, a bell, a pomegranate, a bell, a pomegranate, a bell, and he will make sounds when he moves. Ding, 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 ding. He moves. And before he enters, they tie a rope around his leg so that as they go in, all the other priests will be possibly somewhere outside. All straining their ears carefully as he enters in. They will hear ding, 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 ding. And they will say, it's all right. <laughs> if they hear ding, 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 poof. It will be finished for the year. They will have to slowly drag him out. Because no one could reach him. Everyone who goes in will die. Which is why the rope was important. To drag his dead body out. You could imagine in those days, the priest better be very fit. Because if he is a slightly over chubby priest, and his moments are a bit slow. Uh, where's the incense? Um, uh, okay. Where's the incense? Uh, I think this is what I'll do. And uh, put the incense there. Slowly moves in, but he, instead of moving on fourth gear, he moves on half gear. And it's a bit slow, and as he enters, before he could put the blood in, his halfway, the smoke finished. He will die. He has to be fit and fast to go in under the cloud covering and put the uh, blood on the altar, sprinkle it on the altar, uh, on the Ark of the Covenant and come out before the cloud covering dispersed. It was a really awesome time, frightening. If he missed it, he missed it. So there was the importance, and, and they understood the importance of the cloud covering as they approached the incense of God. Which is why we have said before that that incense represents prayer, praise, and worship. Especially worship. And uh, even all prayer has to be mixed with worship. Paul in Philippians 4 says to us, that uh, bring before God your supplications, the prayers, with thanksgiving, which is at least the beginning of uh, praise and worship. Start with thanksgiving, go into praise, and then go into worship. You begin to thank Him for what He has done, then you thank Him for uh, who He is, and then you experience Him in worship. It's always mixed with worship. And we realize that is the incense of our prayers and our worship that actually protects us from the presence of God. He's so awesome that the moment there is no praise and worship, a lot of Christians just say, Lord, Lord, reveal yourself. Reveal. And if God were to reveal Himself without their being filled with praise and worship, they will find that the next moment after the revelation in heaven. <laughs> say, God, how do I, how do I get here? Well, when I appear, you die. <laughs> So we realize that it's important, which is why in heaven, with something I never understood before, why all the creatures around the throne, all they'll do is look up to God and say, Holy, Holy, Holy is the Lord of hosts. And they start again. Holy, Holy, Holy is the Lord of hosts. And then they start again. Holy, holy, holy is 
a lot of holes. And he started again. What a job. Praise and worship continually before God. Until God began to reveal, even the heavens cannot contain Him. The only area where, where He can be contained is praise and worship must be there. If for one moment praise and worship ceases, nothing can contain Him. That's why in heaven there is continuous praise. The only time you hear about the silence is when the destruction starts coming. Tell you the presence of God is so powerful. We can remove these two now, thank you. Let's get rid of the veil. Hallelujah. <laughs> when the presence of God is so powerful that wherever praise and worship Jesus, where the covering is no more, no, nothing can stand in that awesome presence of God. We need that worship. So we see the importance of the center and the cloud covering, which Moses understands. And this is where it's important. Once you understand the principles of God and how He works, which is where the third way comes in. Not only is that cloud powerful enough in that tabernacle, that principle can be applied anywhere, any place. In other words, once you have got through the first two areas, you know you're using the right incense at the right time. You know, number two, you're doing the exact call and purpose of God. Whether you're out there slogging away doing God's perfect will, unrecognized and, uh, and uh, uh, not, not uh, accepted, knowing you're in the perfect will of God, as you get those two correct, all you want to do in life is to live and die having done the perfect will of God and you're faithfully doing that which God has called you to, there will be in a third way a special incense and presence that will enable you to take that which you have in your private life and begin to bring it out in the public to save mankind. An interesting thing happened in the book of Numbers chapter 16. Numbers chapter 16, we see in Numbers chapter 16, in verse 41 onwards, on the next day, all the congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron, saying, You have killed the people of the Lord. Now it happened when the congregation had gathered against Moses and Aaron, that they turned toward the tabernacle of meeting and Suddenly, the cloud covered and the glory of the Lord appeared. Then Moses and Aaron came before the tabernacle of meeting. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Get away from among this congregation, that I may consume them. You see, if God were to appear minus the cloud, it's finished. And Moses and Aaron fell on their faces in verse 45. And in verse 46, look at the last line of verse 46, the last sentence. The plague has begun. In other words, God started showing His presence out among the people without the clouds. And the people started dying like flies. The moment it happened, Moses did something that was unscheduled, not planned. Moses told Aaron in Numbers 16, the book of Numbers 16, he says in verse 46, Aaron, he says, take a censer, put fire in it from the altar, put incense, and take it quickly to the congregation, for the wrath of God has come. Understand what the wrath of God is. God doesn't have to do anything. His presence is so powerful, if He shows up without praise and worship, destruction dies. Which is why you see, you, you see the, in the book of Revelation, the wrath of the Lamb. They cry for the mountains to cover them and He couldn't cover them. The, but the book of Revelation make this statement, Yet they will not worship Him. 
They blaspheme Him. They curse Him. If they only know, the only key is that every knee bow and every tongue confess that He is Lord. Then the incense comes up to protect us. When the wrath of God begins to take place. Now Moses did something that was unscheduled. When the plague began and the people died, they began dropping down like flies, dying. Moses said, Aaron, Aaron, faster, faster, get the censer, put, put the incense, run and cover the people. Because Moses knew the understanding of the cloud of incense. And Aaron, I mean, he ran like he never ran before in his life. It was like a race with an egg. <laughs> if Aaron was a Malaysian, he had to quickly, you know, hold fast to his sarong and run. And I want to remind you that the priestly garment was not made for running. <laughs> You never see some, somebody appear in the Olympic race. And they are about to take the 100 meter dash. In, and everybody wears shorts, but they are in full robes. They wear full robes, ready for the dash. It was not made for running. Aaron has to pick up his sarong. Hold the sensor at the same time. Run! Ah, come on! Hold oh, among the people! And the Bible tells us that he has, when he stands between God and the people, the plague stops. The cloud was the most important thing. In the book of Numbers chapter 16, we see here, Aaron ran with a censer in verse 48. He stood between the dead and the living. I tell you, Aaron was there. And uh, I don't know what your Penang Hokkien is, but uh, he says, Aaron was Chua. <laughs> Holding the censer behind him every one day. Uh, and uh, on one side, all the day, and he's standing between God and the people. <laughs> oh my God, look, the censer, Lord, the censer. <laughs> Good thing God didn't say, censer, the censer. He got the censer. And... The interesting thing, God respected His own incense. When God saw the incense that He required, and it was supposed to be done only in the most holy place, God recognized it. And the plague stopped. That's the awesome presence of God that He came to bring forth. That's what that censor ties up to. That which God is doing in our time. But in conclusion, there are three things that are important for us to consider. The Day of Atonement for Aaron to bring that censer into the most holy place, where the cloud is effective, is number one, a day where everyone in the nation fasted. And God said, if anyone will not fast, or afflict themselves, which is the other way of saying they should fast, they will be cut off. I'm not making this up. Numbers uh, in, in the book of uh, Leviticus 23. Leviticus 23, verse 29. If any person who is not afflicted of soul, on that same day he shall be cut off from his people. The third wave and the third move as we enter into it is marked by a call not of personal fast but of a corporate fast. 
we see a type of that. When leaders fast, when corporate fast for the congregation, it is a fast, it was a national fast. The third way is if in, involves all these things. The first is the day has to be prepared. And nine days earlier, the trumpet call has gone out. Now on the tenth day, they must prepare for national fast. The second thing we realized was that Aaron, as we had touched earlier, had to have all his garments ready and all those things are established. He had to wash himself, cleanse himself. You read how many times in, in uh, the book of uh, Leviticus 16, he has to wash himself and cleanse himself. It's repeated so many times. You can't miss it. He had to wash with water this, wash with water that. He had to cloth himself. There has to be a restoration of all the priestly garments. If we have time, we may look into that. And then, the third is the greatest blessing. Entrance into the second veil. Safely. And all these are prophetically prophesied in the book of Joel. Let's look over at the book of Joel. Chapter 2. And I want you to notice three patterns in the last wave. We see three areas here. Verse 23. Be glad then, you children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God. Chapter 2, verse 23. For he has given you the former rain faithfully, and he will cause the rain to come down for you, the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. Notice the former and the latter rain come together. The threshing floor shall be full of wheat, and the vat shall overflow with new wine and oil. Number one, there will be a refreshing, the rain from above. Former rain and latter rain in the first month. Secondly, verse 25, I will restore to you the year, years that the swarming locust has eaten, the crawling locust, the consuming locust, and the chewing locust. What do these locusts represent? We know in biblical teaching that there was an actual locust plague. But in eschatological prophecy, it points towards demonic powers. If you study the book of Revelation, the locusts represent demon powers. Ephesians 6 tells us there are four classes of demons. And there are four classes of locusts. Ephesians 6 verse 18 tells us, For we wrestle not with flesh and blood. Verse 12 tells us that that we wrestle not with flesh and blood, but against number one principalities, number two powers, number three wicked rulers of the darkness of this age, and number four wicked spirits in heavenly places, four classes of demons. God says, I will restore. There will be number two, a restoration. And then number three, verse 28, it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Number three, an outpouring. Many people do not realize there's a difference between refreshing, restoration and outpouring. My friends, the third way is the outpouring. And you see the three major moves. The first one, the refreshing. And refreshing will keep coming. The second one, the restoration. The final one, the outpouring, which will include the other two. But like the incense, all these are preceded in chapter 2, verse 1, the trumpet sound. But when many people see the trumpet sound in chapter 2, they think it's a trumpet call for war. Read carefully the context. 
is a trumpet call to fast. Let's not get it out of context. Blow the trumpet. It tells us there will be an invasion. But it tells us here in verse 12. Now therefore, turn to me with all your heart with fasting, with weeping. Look at verse 15. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Consecrate a fast. As I said, the day of atonement is preceded by a fasting. Not of individual fast, a corporate fast in the Lord. And all those three patterns will move and will flow. There will be a refreshing, there will be a restoration, there will be an outpouring. Now the outpouring includes the other two. But the refreshing and restoration are different from the full outpouring. Even in the book of Acts, you notice a difference. In Acts chapter 3, as Peter preached, he says, Acts 3 verse 19, Repent therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted up, verse 19, so that times of refreshing... Notice it's connected to the Passover, forgiveness of sins, etc. The Passover move. Signs of refreshing that will keep coming. Then we see here, verse 21. Whom heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things. That's the Pentecostal era. What are we moving into? Restoration of the ministries, restoration of the church, restoration of the gifts, restoration of everything that the swarming locusts, the chewing locusts, the consuming locusts, and the crawling locusts has taken away. Then, as prophesied in Acts 2, we see the outpouring. And you notice the outpouring has a prophetic element. There was a beginning in Acts 2, but it's not the ending. He only says that this is what was prophesied, but it's not completed. You can see obviously that verse 19 and 20 are not completed yet. But you see the outpouring in verse 17, the spirit of prophecy coming, talking about the prophetic age. And in verse 19, uh, verse 18. And on my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they shall prophesy. I will pour out. There is a difference between a rain, an abundance of rain, and a downpour. And what God is doing in a third wave at the altar incense. We need to understand the three calls that are going forth in the Feast of Trumpets. The call to pray. The call to fast. The call to praise and worship Him. We do not offer the natural incense anymore. The days are over. But we offer spiritual incense which are the prayers of the saints. The worship of the saints. And the trumpet call has gone forth. Never before in any generation, in any other generation, is praise and worship so highly emphasized. Never before in any other generation do you find that a worship minister can draw the same crowds as an evangelist or a prophet. But I guarantee you the time has come when the worship ministers, when they do come in that anointing, will draw as big a crowd as the prophets, the apostles, the evangelists, the pastors and the teachers. As they move into that face, because it's the feast of trumpets, it's a call to worship, it's a call to pray, it's a time to move into that third way that God wants us to move into. That has been prophesied 
from of old. Don't forget the other two, which will still continue in some measure. But we have to move into that third area. Let's go to God in prayer.